Hello? Andreas, you ready? Okay. So I uh, wonder whether the computer is ready. <laughs> <laughs> so I think right. now Karina will help us to start the presentation. And meanwhile, I introduce to all the public uh, Andreas Radbrook. Uh, you know, Andreas, we have uh, now how many people we have. Uh, we are a 700 listener at the moment. And uh, Andreas Radbrook uh, is uh, um, a very famous uh, scientist. You know, he is the president uh, of the uh, European uh, um, Union of Immunological Societies. He is uh, uh, also the scientific director of the German Research Center for Rheumatology that is in Berlin, and is professor of rheumatology, uh, always uh, in Berlin at the Humboldt University. He has been working a long time on B cells, that's why I know him so well, and uh, he's the first one who's found something really very important about B cells. This is the long live uh, plasma cells, they're now called memory plasma cells. And that is the, the, the main uh, system to protect us from reinfection. But today, uh, Andreas will talk about uh, the COVID-19 and how the adaptive immunity uh, towards this disease works. So remember, you can give, you can make the questions, and I leave the uh, the stage to Andreas. Please, Andreas. Yeah, if I the, hope. If, ah, yeah, they start. This is Karina helping us. Thank you, Rita. And that Karina will change the slide. Okay, thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Rita, for this very nice um, introduction. It's a great pleasure for me. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, uh, to discuss um, the role of immunological memory in virus defense with a special um, reference to uh, SARS CoV 2. Uh, although we very, know very little about this particular virus at this time and its relation to hemorrhagical memory, we know quite a bit and actually have changed concepts in the recent past um, on how hemorrhagical memory is organized. And I will uh, take 20 minutes or so just for a very rough um, uh, ride um, across uh, what I think at least are the decisive characteristics of hemorrhagical memory and how it actually adapts us to the uh, pathogens of um, our environment. Those that have always been there, those are new in the field, new players um, on, uh, in the game. And um, for those that always have been there, I think um, uh, everybody is aware that we have an innate uh, branch of the immune system, uh, an immune system that we share with um, most other animals, consisting of a diversity of cells, actually dendritic cells, mast cells, granulocytes, etc., cetera, um, which, um, which protect us actually against um, evolutionary conserved patterns um, uh, of pathogens. And, um, and then uh, what we have recently um, acquired in evolution is the adaptive branch of the immune system consisting of lymphocytes, which have uh, particular types of antigen receptors. Um, and I don't want to go into the molecular details, actually, of these, but uh, just to make clear, actually, um, that, um, that we have a plethora of, um, of different um, lymphocytes with different, with different, which just are distinct by the antigen receptor that they express um, uh, hundreds of thousands of different antigen receptors in each individual recognize nearly every structure that you can imagine. Now, um, they, these lymphocytes have these antigen receptors and because of reasons of tolerance, maintenance, if, uh, if they are stimulated just by the antigen receptor, they probably will be eliminated and die. Uh, so they need also other receptors which control their activation and that has been actually part of, of other seminars and webinars. Uh, for for the story today, actually, I think it's just important to know uh, that the cells of the innate immune system, when they sense uh, a pathogen um, and uh, and classify it as an um, as a dangerous, uh, potentially dangerous uh, structure, uh, they were presented uh, to T lymphocytes, one of the two types, two base types of lymphocytes. And uh, they will actually select those that have fitting antigen receptors and alarm them. 
And then actually um, these um, lymphocytes, the um, activated T cells uh, will help activated B lymphocytes, the other branch of the lymphocytes, those that have antibodies as antigen receptors and activate those as well and instruct them actually uh, to um, produce, um, uh, to, to multiply. So one of the basic features is actually that the, the selected um, and activated lymphocytes, B and T cells, multiply by cell division, something that has been called clonal selection um, uh, by McFarlane Burnett. Now, the important part of uh, this immune response that um, I will allude on in a little bit more detail is actually that the B cells can then differentiate into plasma cells. And plasma cells are uh, just cells that instead of uh, deposing the antibodies on the surface uh, as an instrument to sense the antigen, they now secrete these antibodies and the antibodies actually in the best of all possible cases neutralize um, the virus. They bind to it, they agglutinate it, they prevent actually the, um, uh, the virus from docking on uh, to its uh, target cells. Now, uh, I have not the time to address uh, very important aspects of this primary immune re uh, reaction, the expression of cytokines and chemokines, which regulate the immune uh, response and um, and actually um, neither uh, the generation of cytotoxic CD8 T lymphocytes and memory CD8 T cells. And uh, last but not least, I will not go really into detail of somatic hypermutation and antibody class switching, which actually is controlled uh, by the cytokines uh, of the activated T cells and is an imprinting of the activated B cells in order to uh, attach different functions to the antigen binding regions of uh, their uh, antibodies. So the basic um, point I want to address today is actually the difference between B lymphocytes using antibodies to sense antigens and plasma cells, which secrete the antibodies at high rates, but actually uh, most of them don't have the antigen, uh, the antigen receptors um, on their surfaces. So they are insensitive uh, to, uh, to antigen. Now I will, would like to get to the next slide, actually. Um, sorry. Yep. Um, so actually, um, the, the, I come to memory in this primer, the generation of me memory in the primary immune reaction. And that is uh, the amazing ability of the immune system to sense actually when the antigen is eliminated and take this actually as a, as a sign that it has been successful and conserving some of the activated lymphocytes, the T and B cells, in the form of memory B and T lymphocytes. And this uh, has been um, termed by Rafi Ahmed and others as kind of reactive memory. So we have now more of the cells that we originally held, had, and they are functionally imprinted. And um, so the question comes actually, the antigen is gone that had uh, amplified uh, these cells and kept them alive. So how they actually uh, are organized and kept alive in the absence um, uh, of antigen? Where and how are memory lymphocytes maintained? And the answer of this actually has been given already more than 50 years ago by the late uh, James Gowans from Oxford uh, university in a remarkable set of experiments. And I just want to show one of these experiments of the uh, 1960s in which um, uh, James Goins and uh, his collaborator McGregor drained uh, lymphocytes from the thoracic duct of rats for several days. After about four to five days, there were no more lymphocytes in the lymph that they drained and they concluded that they had removed the circulating lymphocytes. Now they did that for two types of rats, namely those that were naive to a certain immunization and those that had been immunized four weeks ago. And uh, the result is shown in this remarkable figure here in which you see actually that, um, that uh, naive animal rats, when, they had been, <clears throat> when the circulating lymphocytes had been removed, were not able to mount the primary immune reaction. In other words, the naive lymphocytes had been circulating. In the contrary, actually, when the animals had seen the antigen four weeks ago, 
their immune response was as prominent, if not more prominent, than the ones of just a control group of normal uh, rats that had not been drained at all. In other words, what this experiment shows is that memory lymphocytes reside in tissue. It doesn't exclude that they're also circulating memory lymphocytes, but there are enough memory lymphocytes in the tissue to mount an as prominent immune reaction um, uh, as, um, un, as control animals. So the question comes up in which tissue do the, uh, do the uh, memory lymphocytes reside? And others have shown that um, uh, lymphocytes um, generated or uh, uh, generate an immune response of epithelial tissues, of ep epithelial insults, or main, can be maintained in epithelial tissue. My group actually has concentrated a bit more on those memory lymphocytes that are generated in response to a systemic challenge, that is viruses that go everywhere uh, in the body. And uh, this particular experiment here shows actually what happens if we track uh, CD4 memory T cells, memory helper cells, in an immune response to LCMV, lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus. Um, and we see here immediately and very clearly actually that in the initial phase of the immune reaction, the cells are expanding in the spleen and in the lymph nodes, but over time they disappear from the spleen and the lymph nodes. Instead, a, po a stable population of about 10 to 20% of the peak numbers here is established in the bone marrow and is maintained in the bone marrow in these mice over the time of uh, observation. And to take a long story short, actually, we could show in the meantime for humans and mice that memory CD4 and CD8 cells, the memory plasma cells I will address in a moment. And recently also in the just impressed, sorry, this was too, too fast. Just in press and nature communications, we have um, a paper showing that also resident memory B cell populations are maintained in the bone marrow. And they are maintained actually touching on stromal cells, which make up about one to 4% of the entire bone marrow cells. And this is obvious here in raw data. I hope you can see the beauty of this picture, uh, which was provided by Anja Hauser to me, you we'll see here in green uh, memory cells, in this particular case, memory plasma cells spread all over the bone marrow. The picture actually already shows you that one memory cell only touches one stroma cell. One stroma cell can only host one memory cell. And that actually immediately shows actually how the space for immunological memory is defined. It is defined by the number of available stroma cells that can host individually uh, a memory cell. And uh, these stroma cells actually uh, host this um, memory cell not only as kind of providing a physical space, but as you see here in red, the memory cell, in green, the stroma cell, in yellow, you see the contact area, second harmonic generation. And you see that the memory cell actually is tightly linked to the uh, stroma cell. And um, we recently have been able actually to show that this physical link <clears throat> by integrins and other cell-cell um, linkage molecules activates the PI3 kinase, the AKT pathway, and inactivates uh, FOXO1, blocks FOXO1. And um, this, in the case of, um, of long-lived plasma cells, together with the signal that um, cytokines like BAF and April confer via the B cell maturation antigen, which activates NF kappa B, seems to be uh, necessary and sufficient to keep these cells alive on the long run. We have put this uh, as a preprint on bioarchives. And what actually is, uh, is the intriguing uh, feature is that the cell contact to the stroma cell via PI3 kinase activation um, is uh, sufficient to reduce the metabolic stress, the mitochondrial stress, and prevent the activation of the caspases 3 and 7, while the NF-kappa B signaling, which in the plasma cells is <clears throat> activated through BCMA, is apparently just, it may influence this a little bit, but essential it is for prevention of the, cleave, of the activation of caspase 12, and that is actually uh, activated when the endoplasmatic stress 
uh, uh, becomes too much uh, for the cell. The stress associated with the production of uh, secreted antibodies at high rate. So, um, so if we, if it comes to where the cells are activated, are uh, deposited, they are act deposited in the bone marrow when it comes to systemic memory, and epithelial tissues when it comes to epithelial memory. And apparently, it's the tight contact between stromal cells, which organize immunological memory and activate PI3 kinase signaling in the memory lymphocytes, an essential step to keep these cells alive. Interestingly, as resting cells, because you probably all are aware that also activation via the antigen receptor activates the PI3 kinase signaling pathway. But in that case, the cells are proliferating and becoming activated. NF-kappa-B signaling may be a special thing for plasma cells because it is required actually mostly to cope with the stress of antibody production, that is endoplasmatic stress, reticulum stress. So let me just uh, briefly touch on why it is so important to maintain uh, memory lymphocytes. And the reason is not only that they are numerically amplified, as has been believed for some, angel, some time actually, uh, by some people, but I think the main reason is that these cells are also imprinted functionally. And, um, and that one thing is the antibody class switch, which I didn't have time to go into. The other thing is uh, the immune functions of memory T lymphocytes. And actually brings me to the point that uh, there is uh, different flavors of um, T cell differentiation. Uh, here you are all familiar with this TH1, 2, 3, etc. nomenclature, which uh, right now has faded a little bit in kind of a as, um, as Tim Mossman would call it, um, a landscape actually of T cell differentiation. Uh, but uh, apparently particular transcription factors play an essential role in controlling this and keeping uh, the information on which cytokines and chemokines to express imprinted in the resting memory T lymphocytes. And uh, we have called that cytokine memory a feature that actually reflects that in the primary activation, the naive T cell needs an additional stimulus like interleukin-12 if it is instructed to produce a cytokine like gamma interferon. But even then, the naive activated T cell will sequentially express different cytokines, IL-2 interferon gamma and IL-10, as we have shown many years ago, and then it will come to rest again. But uh, if it is re-stimulated as an activated memory T cell, uh, then it only needs the antigen stimulus. And within hours, it will actually uh, secrete uh, many, much more of each of these cytokines it has learned actually uh, to uh, express in the primary activation. And the molecular basis of that is epigenetic imprinting as shown here for the gamma interferon genes. In this case, in human CD4 memory T cells, yellow reflecting an opening of CPG motifs, and blue actually the uh, methylated and closed promoter, and CNS1 region of the gene. That is the DNA regions controlling the expression um, of the gene uh, are opened actually, and can be addressed just by transcription factors like NFAT, uh, which are just dependent on antigen receptor activation and no longer uh, on activation of co-stimulatory, the IL-12 receptor, for example. Um, and this uh, functional imprinting of T cells and also the antibody class for B cells reversely, just one example here, how important it is actually to get a successful immune response uh, and to make the point that a balanced functional T cell response is required to limit immunopathology. In this experiment of Max Learning's group, um, published a few years ago, mice were actually um, forced, um, they, they only had Th1, only had Th2 lymphocytes reacting LCMV in the lung and in the entire body actually. And they also had a cell type which actually had a mixed phenotype, a Th1 and 2 um, uh, mixed phenotype. And as you can see here, for example, for the mucus production in the lung here, it was only the mixed phenotype which was able to limit mucus production in the lung and uh, cell infiltration in the lung as also shown here in the uh, statistical uh, evaluation. So we need actually a balanced functional T cell response uh, to prevent actually immunopathology, which in the end could be more dam damaging uh, than the pathogen itself. Uh, 
So what does this mean for our immune response to SARS-CoV-2? It says if, it means that actually primary natural infection will probably in most persons primarily generate reactive memory. And probably most protect, also protective antibodies will disappear within months. Our genetic background and immunological experiences determine our immune competence. And obviously humans respond to SARS-CoV-2 very heterogeneously, some not at all, some with the wrong type of response, as just exemplified for the mice. And why is that actually the case? So the wrong type of response may be due to, for example, lack of specific naive lymphocytes in aged persons, something, a phenomenon that we still do not understand very well. It, is a, it could also be due actually to cross-reactive uh, memory uh, cells, memory cells that had been um, generated in a different type of immune response to a different antigen, which also recognized SARS-CoV-2, but now, they, since they have been um, activated, for example, in response to an allergen, they now show the wrong imprinting and actually uh, damage um, the immune response. Or it could be finally disease-enhancing antibodies, that is, antibodies that have the wrong class, and alarm the uh, innate immune system uh, to, to actually uh, secrete cytokines in a damaging way. So the wrong type of response means persistence of antigen, of pathogen, no memory form, damaged by immunopathology, and interesting for my field of expertise, eventually autoimmunity. So what happens actually when the antigen comes again, and how can we achieve stable antibody titers? Now, if the reactive memory is stimulated again in a second wave of infection or with a vaccine that is repeatedly given, we get secondary immune reactions. And the point that I want to make on this is that um, we generate more memory B and memory T cells. But the important point I want to address finally here is that now we get memory plasma cells. And the memory plasma cells not only make antibodies that <clears throat> um, protect us from, the, from this particular secondary infection, but they also, for the time being, actually secrete these antibodies into the serum, uh, pro providing us with a long-term protection. And this long-term protection actually can be very long. So the antibodies secreted by memory plasma cells protect us against the pathogens of our environment that are recurrent. So while in the, in the primary response, the antibody titers are very low that are generated over time. And a secondary response, which is faster and has a higher magnitude, is functionally adapted. Antibodies are generated that prevent actually the reactivation of, of the reactive memory and protect, uh, protect us over time. And uh, very drastic actually shown here by data from Max Slivka and his group, who have monitored actually the antibody titers against various viruses in this particular picture here over lifetime of humans. And if you look at just the antibody half-lives here, the shortest one is uh, about 100 years, but against measles and mumps, uh, it's a few hundred years, the half-life. So in other words, actually the antibody titers are completely stable over lifetime. And <clears throat> not only that, if the concentration of the pathogen changes over time in our environment, actually we still um, could adjust the protective antibody levels uh, by means of the reactivation of memory B and memory T cells of the reactive memory. And I have a very nice picture here uh, by courtesy of Antonio Lanzavecchia, who shows actually what happens um, in a person um, that was immunized with tetanus toxoid and you see here that the antibody titers, uh, antibody concentrations actually increased about a hundredfold in a very short time after this uh, immunization. And then the interesting point I want to make from this picture is it takes about half a year until these antibodies deteriorate to about 10% of the maximum uh, concentration, about 10 times more as it has been before this immunization. So there's a slow decay of these antibodies due to their pretty long half-life in humans. And then after about half a year, the concentration of antibodies is maintained over more than a year, completely stable, 
at this um, 10 times enhanced level. And if then again the person is immunized with tetanus toxicity, you see there's just a very marginal uh, tertiary immune reaction in this case here. So the protective, the adjusting the protective antibody titers here um, has helped actually to, uh, to prevent actually the reactive memory from uh, reacting uh, again. So um, I, I'm coming to the end and uh, just uh, want to briefly summarize uh, what I tried to state actually about our amazing adaptive immunological memory. So in primary infection, the immune system is alarmed, the adaptive immune system, and T and B lymphocytes have to cooperate, and they do cooperate to generate memory B and 2 lymphocytes, something we call reactive memory. This is functionally adapted in terms of cytokine gene expression and antibody class switching to the pathogen. Memory lymphocytes are imprinted for the functions they had when the antigen disappeared. And just the, in, so in connection with getting rid of the antigen, this is classified as success for the, the immune system. And then a secondary infection reactivates memory B and T lymphocytes the secondary immune reaction is more efficient, faster, and now memory plasma cells are generated because presumably only reactivated memory B cells can develop into memory plasma cells, although this point not really has been established uh, firmly. It could actually also be generated in one uh, infection if this infection is prolonged and within a this one infection cycle, it comes to the reactivation of memory B lymphocytes. So that is actually happening also. But the memory plasma cells secrete antibodies neutralizing the infectious pathogen, and we are protected for life. This we call protective memory against, but one should also keep in mind that this protective memory is protective only against a certain concentration of antigen. So immunological memory is a quantitative memory. And just uh, dripping us into antigen and uh, increasing the antigen concentration tremendously uh, is actually um, counteracted by the reactive memory, which adapts us to enhance abundancy or also a changed phenotype of the infectious pathogen. So what does this mean again for our immune response to SARS-CoV-2? The primary natural infection will probably in many persons primarily generate reactive memory and probably most antibodies will disappear within months. Apparently humans respond to SARS-CoV-2 very heterogeneously, not always successfully, sometimes detrimental, and effective reactive memory is then not generated. And in a secondary immune reaction to SARS-CoV-2, patients may still be infectious. It's just faster, uh, but it still is an infectious uh, secondary immune reaction. Intentional natural infection to create herd immunity is, I think, from an immunological viewpoint, very ineffective and uncontrollable. And on top, the virus probably has ways to trick the immune system. I think that's something that uh, we immunologists have to find out in the next uh, years to come. And contrary, actually, we think I think that a vaccine can be tailored to stimulate an efficient immune reaction and more persons than the virus actually has done and to avoid detrimental ones as far as, as, as possible. And the big advantage of a vaccine is also that it can be given repeatedly in defined dose and route of immunization to generate memory plasma cells and thus long lasting protective antibody titers. Now we don't really know about SARS-CoV-2 in detail, but on my final slide actually, I uh, refer to um, data from Leo and colleagues in the Journal of Infectious Diseases uh, who have analyzed actually neutralizing antibody to SARS-1, uh, the original severe acute respiratory syndrome um, uh, virus. And this is actually following the antibody titers over two years, 24 months, uh, in a number of patients. And you see here that actually the antibody um, concentrations within two years um, nearly disappear. So that is just to uh, confirm actually that at least for SARS-CoV-1 or SARS-1, uh, we have already data that indicate uh, that the primary infection does not generate long-lasting um, uh, humoral memory, protective memory conferred by memory plasma cells. And that is why we need urgently a vaccine. And I think we need technology platforms to generate efficient generic vaccines so fast 
that they can be used in an ongoing pandemic. And that was my take home message for today. Thank you very much actually for your attention. And I'm looking forward to <coughs> discuss actually uh, your questions or remarks or comments with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Rita? No? Yes? It's exactly in reality the conclusion that you made because many people say they always memory to, to the previous uh, SARS. So you just explained that the memory to SARS is lost because of lack of recall. Is that what you want to say? Yes, that is exactly the point. And, uh, and to create recall by natural infection is not a very smart idea, I think. <laughs> And then, and then we had also comments on the countries that have decided to use uh, the the heart system to create herd immunity and will not work. Maybe we should inform the public of this, right? Something you know, the the politicians that it would, yeah. doesn't work, doesn't work. Okay, uh, several questions. So the first question was concerning the beginning of your presentation. You showed that, that the stroma cells uh, uh, have space only for one memory cell in the, the bone marrow. So the idea is, is there a competition between, uh, for example, plasma cells and memory B cells from space in the bone marrow? And how do the T cells do also? Do they also sit on one stroma cells? Is a different type of stroma cells than the one for B? Yeah, that is an interesting question, and thanks for it. And uh, and uh, it's only two groups actually so far who have deciphered you know, the heterogeneity of stroma cells on a single cell level. And we have published a paper in the European Journal of Immunology, actually showing that there is a tremendous or remarkable heterogeneity among the stroma cells, in particular with expression to signature genes uh, that refer to the dialogue with the hematopoietic system not only with memory, also actually with the generation of hematopoietic cells. And the, the dishes are different. And we actually um, know in the meantime that, for example, even for plasma cells, memory plasma cells, there's different niches. The IgA plasma mm -hmm. secreting plasma cells in the bone marrow use different stroma cells than IgG um, secreting um, plasma cells. And uh, that we actually found out by, by accident using uh, looking at salmonella infection. And uh, interestingly, salmonella is able to eliminate IgG secreting plasma cells from the bone marrow selectively, not the other ones. And the reason is actually that it, uh, salmonella uh, secretes um, a peptide that has similarity to laminin beta 1. And laminin beta 1 is an exclusive component of the stroma cell niche for IgG secreting plasma cells in the bone marrow. And, and, and like this, you can follow this up for the other memory cells. Uh, just the CD4 and CD8 T cells use similar niches. Memory B cells apparently also use laminin beta 1 uh, positive niches um, and so on. So the, the there is different types of memory cells have different types of stroma cell niches. But of course, if the niches are all full, then competition has to take place and old people Competition has to take place between newly generated plasma cells um, and the old ones um, that are still sitting there. And that is something that is incompletely understood, how that actually works. But it has to be this way. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, and then many, many people asked uh, um, about the cross reaction and the damaging antibodies. Uh, so can we do something uh, when the patient does damaging antibodies? Will uh, be, for example, plasma useful in those cases? Because we don't know why somebody's making that damaging antibodies, correct? And uh, yeah, that's correct. I mean, we don't really know why. It, apparently, it's very few people who make that. And um, as far mm -hmm. as I know, uh, so this, we, we don't really know why this is so. And, but we can, it's again one argument for a vaccine that is actually controlled for the generation of such adverse antibodies. Uh, how to treat these people, that is difficult to say. In any case, actually, plasmapheresis, or that is um, immunoabsorption, 
uh, would be one way to do that and uh, and replace it actually with um, um, antibodies from from people who have just recovered uh, from uh, successfully actually from from the virus and don't have uh, virus infection and don't have these antibodies. I think that's um, another technology that we have so much experience over the last 20, 30 years with um, thera therapeutic antibodies in rheumatology, for example. Um, we know all these techniques, we can do GMP and we actually can extract very fast the genetic information to create uh, protective antibodies against any virus and those actually we need, that is in a technology platform which i think we also need them in a pandemic actually to be able to protect those who are at immediate um, risk actually of getting the disease or have it um, in a certain way uh, to protect them actually with a, a bio uh, bi biotechnology uh, gmp manufactured protective human antibodies okay do, do we know whether the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 is particularly slow, or is this just a normal response in this case? So, I mean, why are people getting so sick in reality? That's the, always the same questions, no? Yeah, I think it is, uh, it is uh, slow in a way that um, apparently it needs some time to develop. From It's a mixed thing. It starts as a tissue a lung actually uh, resident um, uh, infection and uh, apparently it takes some time until it becomes a systemic. I think this the switch from epithelial to systemic um, uh, infection or stages of the infection takes particularly long in this case. So that is probably one of the reasons why actually, <clears throat> why actually it may be very difficult to understand it may be a mixed, a mixed immune reaction also, in a certain sense, resident in the lung epithelium, but also then actually later on, and then those that get a systemic provocation or, or manifestation of the disease, also um, then in the bone marrow. It may be different types of immunity, namely um, a kind of mucosal immunity in the lung and systemic immunity in the bone marrow that is generated. Um, another important question was about uh, what is being published so that people sometimes uh, clear, look like they cleared the disease because uh, the PCR is negative for the virus and then the PCR becomes positive again. So does this mean that the immune system worked? Then it didn't work, then it worked again. Do we know anything about this? Yeah, I think that is uh, what I tried to, to say, that, uh, that we have primary and secondary, and we can actually, actually could be intermingled. So the immune system nearly has eliminated the virus, but not completely. So the virus mm -hmm. comes back, actually, and then, uh, and then the reactive memory, hopefully, and, and the good responders is doing its job. Uh, but in those that actually have a detrimental immune response, there's no uh, creation of reactive memory, and they actually have, um, we have to care for them in a special way. Yeah. I think it would be good. Um, I, no, that's okay. Hmm? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so people are asking uh, also some skills. Uh, so you know that the patient at a certain point, uh, especially in the severe cases, uh, get lymphopenia. Uh, do we know whether this is, uh, if, you know, like uh, influencing how the immune system works or instead uh, in reality the point is that we don't know what happens in the local you know in the lungs for example exactly. because we see only the blood you know mm. yeah, the, the yeah. lymphopenia the term is a bit misleading it just means that the cells yeah. disappear in the circulation and, uh, and it could yeah. actually mean that they are just busy and um yeah I think, uh, I think that's that has to be found out that's not clear in fact, the most of the patients with lymphopenia and very severe disease have the highest level of antibodies, so they're working somewhere else, probably. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, and then another question was, can SARS-CoV-2 infect TMB cells? Can the not, virus infect the T? I think it has not been formally excluded, but these I cells do not express the ACE2 receptor, mm -hmm. that is the, recept the conventional receptor that the virus uses and uh, and the viable virus cannot be found in the blood so um, this probably unlikely that, um, uh, that lymphocytes are infected most of the lymphocytes that we have looked at 
um, are, are not no, we have never found virus in, in the, the case. We have looked at quite a few patients now, and there's never been by single cell PCR. There's never been virus material in them. Inside the cells. Uh, then there was uh, another question that was, so I have uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, I make memory cells, and then all of a sudden the virus mutates a little bit. What happens? Yeah, for the B cells, this is a nice challenge. Actually, as long as it happens in, a, um, uh, in an ongoing infection, the B cells can still adapt to it by somatic hypermutation. But also, actually, in a, if it is a secondary infection, the somatic hypermutation of the B cells is the instrument um, how the immune system actually uh, copes with, um, uh, with the uh, mutation of the virus, of the pathogen. Um, and still, actually, most of the virus will not be uh, mutated. Uh, so there will be other antibodies against unmutated parts. So that is not really uh, not a deadly uh, uh, challenge for the immune system. The immune system is, can adapt to that very efficiently, actually. Okay. Then there, was, uh, there were many interesting questions about the Crohn's reaction uh, you mentioned before. And now in the beginning, you mentioned about Crohn's reaction with, uh, for example, self-antigens. Uh, is, is it possible that then after SARS-CoV-2, we will have many uh, or at least some signs of autoimmunity developing after the infection because of the cross reactivity. Yeah, I think that is not, um, it would not be surprising because uh, in those patients which uh, undergo heavy, uh, long lasting immune reactions with, lo with lots of immunopathology, and for example, <clears throat> dead cells that cannot be cleared efficiently. Um, the, there is actually always autoimmunity that will be generated, uh, for example, anti-DNA antibodies. Usually it's transient, but if, the, the, mm -hmm. if it actually comes to a point that a memory plasma cell is generated, that, for example, sees a double-stranded DNA, uh, that actually will probably lead to complications of autoimmunity, like, for example, lupus yeah, or something like that. So we think that uh, many autoimmune diseases, rheumatic diseases, have their origin in inefficient, prolonged immune reactions. Okay. And another question that people have is about uh, stromal cells uh, and uh, memory plasma cells and memory cells. Uh, does the size of the niche changes in older people? So do old people have less space or is the space full? How does it work in older people? There is a report that actually um, one group has reported that there is less uh, memory plasma cells in older uh, people. Um, I think we should wait a little bit um, until there is more data um, on this. Um, it, it's actually the question at which age does this uh, start, uh, that, uh, that the number of stroma cells decreases. Uh, that would be the prerequisite actually to see this. Um, at least in terms of the protective antibody titers for measles, for example, where we have looked at very old people, there was no decrease, actually. Okay. It's okay. And um, there was another question that uh, many people are asking. Is uh, children have no memory cells or very little memory cells? So why did they get so... They, why, why, why do they get a, a, a very light disease? I think they... <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that uh, that's a very good uh, very, question. Yeah. In particular, uh, the, if in, we know from vaccinations that children are ten times about ten times more efficient in responding uh, to vaccination with a generation of memory plasma cells than adults. So the antibody titers that are generated in childhood are, and and that, for example, against measles, and that are maintained then over life are very, um, very high. And we can only speculate why that is so. One, one po possibility would be that actually the bones are growing, there's empty space, there's empty mm -hmm. niches to yeah. compete pre-existing plasma cells, they just have more space. Yeah. So, and, uh, and that's what they sense as the first thing and that it has priority. Yeah. So yeah. But that's a uh, thing uh, for humans, at least, just speculation. Yeah, sure. And maybe one last question, maybe some people ask uh, whether uh, 
mesenchymal stem cells could help uh, in, uh, I don't know, uh, increasing the space for plasma cells. And so if you give to somebody stem, mesenchymal stem cells, what, would they go to the bone marrow? Would they increase the space for memory cells? No? I don't think anybody has tried this, no? It's a bit, yeah, it's a bit the question what you call mesenchymal stem cell. Mm -hmm. um, so we have looked at me as me mesenchymal stroma cells from the bone marrow. My personal opinion is that what people call stem cells is pericytes, that is CD1 in the mice, CD146 positive, mm -hmm. uh, VCAM1 um, positive, CD45 negative cells sitting on the, on the top of the endothelial cells and being able to differentiate into any cell. Mm -hmm. I think these cells could be helpful actually um, if, if there is a kind of um, inborn or acquired deficiency in mesenchymal stroma cells. On the other hand, the established network of mesenchymal stroma cells is actually linked to the architecture of the bone marrow. And I think it's not easy to change that. There is not empty niches for stroma cells, so to speak. They form a network and this is the network. And um, I'm not so sure that um, mesenchymal stem cells could increase it, but nobody has done the experiment. Yeah. It's an interesting experiment. Then uh, one more, really, the last question, maybe. Uh, because we have so many questions, Andreas, you are too good. So uh, the, the many, many people still ask about the uh, treating people with the plasma or with the high affinity antibody generated in the lab. But what's your idea? You already said it, I think, but people already co continue asking. So maybe you have to expand a little bit on this. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I come from Berlin. So um, the first Nobel Prize for medicine was given to Emil von Behring for diphtheria and tetanus um, uh, antibodies actually used as a vaccine, which saved the li uh, lives of hundreds of thousands of, of soldiers in the First World War, actually. And, um, and I think this was one of the first vaccinations done, very efficient, very efficient. And uh, so I think uh, it's time actually to reconsider uh, these kinds of, of uh, therapies, uh, higher serum, as we call it in Germany. And um, I, I think it's a bit difficult if you take it from, if you just take serum from humans. I'm wondering actually, for me, it would be as fast to do it by genetic engineering and because yeah. we know actually from uh, the genes of these uh, antibodies yeah and we could very fast um, engineer them but there is uh, many labs that i know of who are actually chasing such um, antibodies therapeutic antibodies and i think there's the future for therapeutic antibodies they they sh they should be one of the weapons that we have in the arsenal yeah definitely and they can be done very fast because we know how to make them okay so thank you very much, Andreas, for your fantastic presentation. And thank you very much for answering to all our questions. I have to say that I have here a whole lot of compliments from you in the chat, saying uh, thank you for everything and for being here. Thank you, Andreas. Bye-bye. And thank you, Rita, for your moderation. Thank you. <laughs> it was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao.